So good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Corkum. I'm from the University of Ottawa. I'm uh, one of the mafia from Ottawa here. You uh, heard Bob Boyd on the first day. Uh, actually, you even saw a picture of the laboratory in Ottawa. There it is right there. I've got a, just a smaller version. Bob and I share laboratories in the basement down here, occupying really that whole wing of the... Uh, we're side by side. We don't share a laboratory, but we're side by side down in the basement. So it's very, very exciting. We're all building laboratories right now. The building is brand new. Um, uh, however, I also have a laboratory at National Research Council, this beautiful old building sitting right on the Ottawa River. You can see it flowing by there. Um, this was built in 1929, and it's built as a model of Buckingham Palace. So I probably am the only person in the world who has a laboratory in a palace. <laughs> so it's very nice. Actually, it's a wonderful location. The building right there is one of the most historic buildings in Ottawa. It's the home of the first Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, it's now the uh, home of the British High Commissioner. You can tell Cal Canada was a colony for some time because the British High Commissioner owns this, or the British owns this building. And the home of the Prime Minister is down there, not in this one, but down there, about two buildings away. So science is right at the center. Well, maybe it isn't quite, a, it's located at the center, but maybe um, it doesn't play such a deep role in the politics of Canada. But it's a lovely building. If you come, you have to come and see the palace. Um, now, I know that uh, for the first four days, and I think for all of the rest of the workshop, you will be learning about nonlinear optics, nonlinear optics in the perturbative sense. You might remember, I think Benoit started out by saying, we can expand the polarization, the polarizability in terms P sub zero, P1, P1, E, P2, E squared, P3, E, e to the four, E cubed, and so on. So if you were sitting there and thinking about what happens if I turn up the intensity, I'm sure you thought, all chaos, it will just be chaos eventually. Sometime the third order term has to be more important than the second, the th fourth order term more important than the third, and so on. So what happens when ordinary nonlinear optics breaks down? That's what I'll talk about over the next four, five, five hours. But actually the very first part I won't do that. I, we're going to start out by talking just about short pulses, how we characterize them from ordinary lasers. So some of this will be a repeat a little bit of what you heard before, from, especially from uh, Professor Zudmeyer. However, I think it's useful to learn how to describe them correctly. So that's what I'll do. So first thing, when you think of a short pulse, this is just a sketch, all you have to do is understand that it's an interference in time. No different than the interferences in space we're used to thinking about when pulses come in and interfere with each other. This is just an interference in time, an interference between different frequencies of radiation. Oh, I want to use the green pointer. The red one doesn't work very well. OK, so different frequencies of radiation. Here is sketched such a uh, arrangement. I think there are seven frequencies here, all of them slightly different, all of them uh, different by a certain step. And actually, what I've done is I've phased each of those frequencies at this time zero, and then I've added them all together, and there's the short pulse up there. It's not a beautiful short pulse. It's quite short, but it's not a beautiful short pulse because it's only a discrete number of frequencies. In a real laser, there will be many, 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 many more. So, but whenever you think of a short pulse, nothing complicated. It's simply an interference in time. That's all there is. So the next slides I take, I thought I'm going to modify slides given by, or made by Rick Turbino. I don't know if any of you know of it. He, on his website, he has all his lectures. And some of these slides are quite professionally done. And I decided I couldn't compete. So I'm going to take them. I've modified them. So the spelling mistakes are mine. I'm not a good speller, so if you find a spelling mistake, it's certainly mine. Um, but the uh, graphics are from Rick Trubino. So first thing, how do you describe a short pulse? A short pulse has a phase and an intensity. 
So you could write the short pulse as the electric field is equal to some amplitude, which is proportional to the square root of the intensity, e to the i omega t plus phase, where phase is, could be possibly time dependent. So that's, uh, that's how you write it. And generally, this intensity function is a sharply peaked uh, if, if it's an interesting pulse. So that's a general description. In practice, we remove the half, we drop the complex conjugate, and we forget about the carrier frequency, get some carrier frequency, and just ignore it. And that leaves you with a complex amplitude. So here is the complex amplitude. We're left with only the intensity, or whatever it is to make it an electric field, um, and the phase, time-dependent phase. It's a complex amplitude in general because there is possibly a time-dependent phase in any pulse. This is easier to calculate with, and so you can think about the square root of i as being like the amplitude of the electric field in the problem. Now, it's important to be able to think about this in frequency space or in time space. And so I want to just make the transformation from time space to frequency space. So it's useful to be able to make the Fourier transform. So here is the Fourier transform of a pulse that I showed you before. And of course, the inverse transform is written there. So we'll be able to think in frequency and time space. And here is what a frequency-dependent description of the pulse looks like in the same spirit as I wrote the full time-dependent description earlier. Okay, it has an amplitude, again, a spectrum or spectral amplitude, and it has a phase, a phase associated with that spectrum. Within it, there is the frequency of the light you're interested in compared to some carrier frequency or some central frequency in the problem, and it has these two positive and negative components. When we describe it, we do exactly like we did in the time-dependent case. We strip away the complexity, and we're left with, we get rid of the negative frequency components, we get rid of the frequency, the central frequency, and we wrote, write a spectral um, amplitude, a complex spectral amplitude, that has a spectral amplitude here, a spectrum, and a spectral phase, okay? So those are the two different ways to look at it. Both of them are more are equivalent. They both describe the same pulse. So when I wrote down, when I made this illustration here, what did I do? I organized the spectral phase to be the same for all of the, all of the different frequencies in the problem. And actually what I did, well, I just did this in the computer, I made this spectral amplitude, or the amplitude of the spectrum, <laughs> the same for all of these, all of these frequencies in the, in the computer. Okay, so now you know a great deal about how to uh, write a pulse. Let's think about a case, a particular case. If the amplitude structure is Gaussian, a Gaussian pulse, a Gaussian pulse has an amplitude structure, and a Gaussian pulse has the same frequency all the way through, and so it has a constant phase in time. But a Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian, so it's exactly the same in frequency space. It has an amplitude or a spectrum, and it has a flat spectral phase. But of course, not all pulses must have a spe flat spectral phase. The phase could change throughout instead of being organized in one oscillation it can change throughout. So, so the spectral phase is zero. It's useful to take this phase and write it out in a Taylor series. And this can be done in time or in frequency. Um, if frequency, it looks like omega sub zero, omega one, delta omega, and omega two, delta omega, and these are the group velocity and the group velocity dispersion. The group velocity tells you how the envelope moves, that amplitude structure moves in time, and the group velocity dispersion 
tells you how that pulse starts to tear itself apart in time. Um, if for a good pulse, you only need a few of these terms. And it's really important when you're designing a short pulse laser that you understand what these terms are for any given medium. You can also do this Taylor expansion in time. Again, there's a, a phase zero, a phase one with time and time squared. And again, we only need a few terms for a well-defined good pulse that we would like to have. The phase, phase zero, phi zero, is the same both in frequency or in time. And this is the absolute phase or the carrier envelope phase that you heard about yesterday in the talk, in the talk of Dr. Sudmeier. He talked about getting carrier envelope phase stabilized so that you could use frequency combs. So carrier envelope phase describes how the carrier, the oscillation, fits within the envelope. Here sketched is a few different possible ways to arrange the oscillation within the envelope. In fact, there's a continuous set of possible waves, ways to put the wave inside the envelope. Um, it's extremely important for at a second science. We're going to take strong fields, we're going to move things around, and it's awfully important if the wave goes this way and out, or if the wave goes this way and hits you in the face. So it's, one has to be able to control the carrier envelope phase. And it's particularly important for very short pulses because there's a strong difference in the time-dependent force depending on the carrier envelope phase for a very short pulse, much less so for a longer pulse. Here, you, I don't know if you can tell, but sketched are two different carrier envelope phases. And you see them interweaved, and the pulse looks roughly the same. But they're flipped. Okay, so I won't discuss the carrier envelope phase very much. Dr. Sidmeyer did it, and I will just assume that we, will, we can control it throughout the rest of my talk. But I want to introduce you to the idea, how it's described, how it comes up in a description of a short pulse. There is an instantaneous frequency within the pulse, and I want to do that next. I only just spend a minute or two on it, but it will be important because I want to talk about measurement. Next, there is an instantaneous frequency in the pulse. The instantaneous frequency is given by the differential of the phase, and so it's omega sub zero plus d phi eight phase dt. So a pulse can be linearly chirped. It can be linearly chirped if the phase structure has a structure written here in time. I could write it in, in frequency if I wish, but it's nice to write it in time after having said that. It has a phase structure that looks like beta t squared. Just in your mind, uh, take, the, uh, um, take the derivative, and you'll have omega sub zero plus beta t times two. So that will give you a time-dependent frequency in the pulse such a pulse is sketched here. The pulse starts here blue and goes red, but pulses that start red and go blue are possible also. Um, how do you get such a pulse? A short pulse that enters a dispersive medium has a huge bandwidth. Different colors propagate at different rates. That is true for the group velocity. That's what the group velocity dispersion tells us, how the group velocity in the red, green, blue, and so on, change as you go through. And so the pulse that was originally had no phase will pick up this chirp or time-dependent phase because of dispersion in the medium. So it comes from group velocity dispersion, and this group velocity dispersion I introduced you to earlier as in the expansion of the phase. Okay, so now I've described all I'm going to do about characterizing a short pulse. There are more things to look at, and if you're interested in it, uh, I'd suggest you go to the website, find Rick Trevino, and he has more things to talk about, about different details about how you look at these pulses. 
So next thing is how do you create such a short pulse? I want to talk about creating a pulse. There will be two things to worry about. There will be dispersion, which we already talked about just very briefly, that a material with a short pulse is a huge bandwidth, and as it goes through the material, different parts will propagate at different speeds, and so the pulse will come apart, and it will look like the one I just showed you. So that has to be controlled if we're going to make and use short pulses. Otherwise, we might just give up and go home. The second thing that will be absolutely critical is how do we make sure that this frequency and this frequency and this frequency, the ones I drew plus all the ones in between, are perfectly phased together. So how do we make such a pulse? How can we force that to occur? Okay, and that requires nonlinear optics, the conventional nonlinear optics that you've heard before. And I would like to introduce you to it, although again, you heard some yesterday from Dr. Sudmeyer. So first, I thought I would start with the history of short pulses. Short pulses, uh, short laser pulses, mode locking was discovered, I believe, in 1964, four years after the laser. And with mode locking, we were able to, or people were, it wasn't me, were able to make pulses down to about 10 picoseconds. I think from then on, lasers became the way to make the fastest measurements that could be made in all of science. Fastest direct measurements, controllable measurements. I don't mean that you can't look at the decay of a relativistic particle and get information from track lengths, but controlled measurements, the fastest controlled measurements. From then on, so the pulse duration of lasers fell continuously over about 20 years, and it was all really learning to control dispersion and learning how to synchronize the phase perfectly by using nonlinear optics, synchronize the phase perfectly between all of the frequencies within the pulse. Actually, I started working in the field somewhere down here, and I started to make up this curve, actually, because I sort of following along what was happening, and I thought, well, we're getting close to a single cycle, and so I sketched what I thought would happen in some of the talks I would give when I was younger, way back then. Uh, I would show this curve, and I said, it has to level off, right? It has to level off. Of course it did. Uh, we got very close to a single cycle pulse. In that case, it was three cycles, and then you're kind of stuck. It's hard to go shorter than a single cycle pulse, and so everything was tough from then on, and really pulse durations remain fixed for on the order of 15 years until we came to the at a second age, but that's what I'm going to talk about in a little while. I'll come back to this figure again. So all of that has been done through conventional nonlinear. All of this part was done through dispersion control. Each of these steps was learning to control dispersion better and better and better. Okay, so now let me just sort of talk a little bit about lasers and the modes and how we lock them. Again, I took this from Rick Tremino because his figures are better than what I would do. So think of a laser gain medium, a couple of mirrors, an output mirror, and imagine you have a pulse propagating back and forth without distortion in the material. So every time it comes out to the output, there will be a burst of radiation there was one before and before and before that, and there will be more afterwards. We have a sequence of pulses, one after the other, separate in time by the round trip time of the cavity, the time it takes to go around the cavity. If we were to Fourier transform that sequence of pulses, we have a sequence of frequencies, a series of frequencies, a comb of frequencies, if you like. Fourier transform provides us with the comb of frequencies, these frequencies are equally spaced in, in energy or equally spaced in frequency. Um, and they are the longitudinal modes of an ideal oscillator. That is, they're equally spaced modes. They're the longitudinal modes of an ideal oscillator of that length. It's equal, the, they are equally spaced just like a harmonic oscillator has equally spaced energy levels and equally spaced modes. So you can think of it as the harmonic oscillator of lasers. This is an idealized laser. Which modes are occupied depends on how the cavity operates and the gain medium that you place inside the cavity. 
So a short pulse is really just an optical wave packet, just like a wave packet you know from quantum mechanics. So what modes are occupied? So in my area of science, where we tried to go really short, the, the laser, you actually heard it yesterday from Dr. Sudmeier, the laser that everyone uses is Thai sapphire. We use Thai sapphire for a number of reasons, but the main reason is that it has this huge bandwidth so that not only one or two or three or four modes can be occupied, but hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of modes can be occupied, depending on how you design the laser. In fact, we have a bandwidth of about 300 nanometers that it's possible to laze over, and since the carrier frequency is around 800 nanometers, this allows something very close to a single cycle pulse. I will show you in a minute that that can be achieved. The bandwidth is about 200 terahertz, and so you can imagine the number of modes for a cavity separated by you know, a meter or something like that. Um, so there's an awful lot of modes. So over a very large frequency spread, the, uh, the, the index of refraction of any material is not constant, of any material. I don't think there's any material aside from vacuum. There's nothing that's constant. So a short pulse, for example, we might imagine one that I just described about a single cycle and having this huge spectrum that I just described will go through a medium, the gain medium, even the air in the cavity, even the air, will go through the gain medium and it will come out as a chirped pulse. Low frequency propagates more rapidly than high frequency through the air, through sapphire, through lots of things like that. So normal dispersion allows the red frequencies, the group consisting of the red frequencies, to get ahead of the group consisting of the green or the blue. And so a pulse will look like that. Therefore, the round trip time of the cavity will be different for the red and the blue, because the red gets a boost relative to the blue. So the modes are not ideally equally spaced, as I said before. Instead, a real oscillator has a frequency-dependent mode spacing. Sounds like a disaster, doesn't it? Sounds like a disaster. It's exactly like a real molecule. A real molecule was not a harmonic oscillator, as we might like to pretend it is when you do a calculation. It's really an anharmonic oscillator, and if you launched a wave packet in an anharmonic oscillator, the wave packet spreads apart. So you can just jump back and forth between quantum mechanics here, wave packets and optical pulses, and have a good sense. So solving this dispersion problem took two decades. So the refractive index provides its own solution, and I want to introduce you to that solution very quickly and then, then go, go ahead and talk about locking the modes. So you can think about dispersion in space. We bring a short pulse in to a prism. The prism disperses the pulse. Different colors go along different pathways. It sounds like a disaster. The worst idea you could possibly have for a short pulse. The last thing you want to do is take the frequencies and separate them, you would think. The same thing in time, we've already talked about it. So the solution, or one solution, a direction to think on, because there are a whole set of related solutions once you think about the first, is to make these two processes compete, one with the other. They compete with each other. So you can think about it this way. Imagine we have a pulse that has been chirped by going through a medium. We send it through a prism pair like this. Different colors go along different paths. But those paths can be of different lengths for each color, allowing us to allow the blue which fell behind to catch up with the red by the way we set up the prism sequence here. I won't go through the mathematics to show you that the path lengths are different, but I think it's obvious from the figure that the path lengths are different in the material, just in real space. But also you must consider that uh, the red will go through more material, and it gets slowed down by being through material. And so when you put all of those in, it's rather straightforward. You will find that the uh, blue can catch up to the red by going through a prism sequence. 
You must go through twice because there's a spatial offset. And as I said, the last thing you want to do is take the colors and separate them. But if you drive it right back on itself again, the pulse that comes back out again can have all frequencies superimposed because the paths are simply different for each one. So you get the idea, once you get the idea, there are multiple variants on this. You can use gratings and other things. And actually, yesterday in the talk of Dr. Sudmeyer, you heard about using chirp mirrors. Uh, let me show you how this looks like in a, ca in a cavity, just before I go. And then I'll talk about chirp mirrors. Um, in a cavity now, then, what you have is you place these prisms in the cavity to take the unequally spaced longitudinal modes and equalize them, make them equally spaced. That's one way to look at it. Or to take a short pulse that is formed and allow it to propagate, and over one round trip, it comes back and replicates itself. That's the same thing in different words. So the two prisms are placed in here for that reason. And in practice, one or both are placed on a translation stage. So you can add more normal material, regular dispersion, as you wish, to balance the anomalous dispersion that comes from the geometry of the situation. And you can tune the dispersion to zero for the, a few of the terms in the expansion I showed you. I didn't talk about higher order terms, but when you got a really short pulse, you, can, you don't even stop at the group velocity dispersion. Another term becomes important, and everything is to beat down those terms as small as possible. In other words, make the modes as equally spaced as you can possibly make them. Okay, now I'm going to come back to this. This is the, uh, you can think of this, I'll tell you about how these measurements are made in a minute, but you can think about this almost like the oscillations in a pulse. And so from a system like this, you can make a pulse that's almost a single cycle in long. This could be a positive, this could be a negative, and a negative. So it's something like that. Um, <clears throat> but how do we lock the phases of all these colors. That's the next thing. So this is one way to lock the, make, get the dispersion right. Oh, let me have one thing I was going to say. Yesterday you saw cavities that made relatively short pulses, not as short as this, but made relatively short pulses and it didn't have prisms inside. In fact, if you go to many laser labs, you will find no prisms. Many will still have prisms in it. So both both exist simultaneously. It's possible to replace the prisms with chirped mirrors, mirrors designed especially to compensate for the chirp. And so in Dr. Sudmeyer's figures, you often saw a pulse propagate back and forth and bouncing between mirrors for no other reason except, except, except dispersion control. So it's a somewhat, I don't know if it's easier or not than prisms, but they can be perfectly designed uh, and so if you get, know somebody that can make mirrors very well, it's probably superior to prisms. Okay, so the next thing is locking the modes and characterizing the resulting pulse. And then I'm going to go on to the, the high field stuff. So, um, well, you've heard a great deal about nonlinear interactions. So when I first made the first version of this talk, I was going to start out with the polarizability and talk about how N2, the nonlinear, uh, the Kerr effect occurs, but I think we've heard that already in the talk. So you probably already know that if the light intensity gets high enough for a material, non-resonant material, resonances are long out of the way, a non-resonant material, that the refractive index, which would be, say, normally N sub zero, picks up an extra term, an intensity-dependent term. That intensity-dependent term for a symmetric material is N sub zero I or N, N2, rather, N2 I or N2 E squared. You can easily see it both ways. You've got to watch out for the units, in which case, one case or the other. So it can be kind of tricky, but it's the same idea. It depends on the intensity, the refractive index. So now imagine what happens if we bring a short Gaussian spatially shaped pulse in. Well, at low intensity, going through a block of material, nothing happens. The mean just goes through. It says the, it sees the low intensity refractive index, N sub zero, and nothing happens to the pulse 
It comes out looking the way it did coming in, aside from reflection losses. However, at high intensity, the refractive index is changed. It's changed near the center relative to what it is at the edge. It creates a lens. In fact, it creates a focusing lens because N2 is positive. The refractive index gets larger. The phase velocity is slowed down. And the phase is curved as it goes through or as it emerges compared to what it was coming in. You can almost see it, I think, if you think about it. So here's the equation for the phase structure. A high intensity beam self-focuses. The beam focuses because of its own self. It generates a high speed, high speed because there are no resonance close in some materials. You could take another material where it was. But if you take a material where there's no resonance close, then it can respond uh, almost instantly. So it's a high speed self-generating Kerr lens. This is an ideal nonlinearity for short pulses because it responds so rapidly. There's no delay whatsoever, almost no delay. I mean, there will be a delay. But it's, you know, in sapphire, the first resonance is way, way up. OK, so here's how it's used. A pulse is focused into a material. Well, why not use the sapphire of the Thai sapphire? Why not use the gain material itself? The intensity is large enough, and the material length is long enough, it must be, so that the beam begins to focus, self-focus, and so we have the high intensity part, for example, following the path of the green sketched here, and the lower intensity part following the path of the red. Now this beam that partially self-focused, I don't want it to go disastrously, just do it a little bit, um, just a little bit. This beam that partially self-focuses must interact with the cavity in which it's the radiation is trapped. And it's possible to set up the cavity so that the feedback is optimized for, well, let's say the high intensity beam or the low intensity beam, but that's not so interesting. So by setting up the cavity mirrors and the cavity optics appropriately, you can select so that the radiation comes back and hits the gain medium optimally for the high intensity part of the beam. Okay, so, the, uh, so that therefore allows you to favor the high intensity part of the beam over the wings. So then if the pulse is formed, the high intensity part is selected, the wings are shed away, the next round trip we select the high intensity part, we keep throwing away the wings of the pulse and selecting only the high intensity part. That's how it works. Okay, no resonance are close, so the response is very fast. We can drive it down until the gain medium is pulling the pulse apart every round trip, just as you're trying to squeeze it down with this nonlinearity. It is tricky to get it started, so I didn't put in a view graph on this, but maybe I will say it. It's tricky to get it started. It was a, a mode locking method. It's the, pref it's the best mode locking for very short optical pulses. It's a mode locking method discovered in uh, Scotland, actually, by uh, Wilson Sibbett or Wilson Sibbett Group. The way I understand the story, maybe you know better, so you can uh, inter interrupt if you wish. The way I understand the story that the students were working in this new material, uh, titanium sapphire in the laboratory, and they found that sometimes the pulses, the laser just mode locked. And they went up to talk to the advisor, Wilson Sibbett, and said, you know, we got this mode lock laser. And as I understand it, he said, yeah, 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 but you know, noisy lasers are all over the place. Sometimes they look mode locked. This is probably boring. Go back to the lab and work. I'm, I'm editorializing here. Um, so anyway, but you know, they sort of fooling around the lab, and you know, they found that they hit the table, or they kicked the table, and it mode locked even every time, right? So this was no longer just noise. Every time it was mode locked. And so this became known as magic mode locking. Magic mode locking because you kicked the table and uh, it mode locked. This was, it just happened as if by magic. Of course, um, so it wasn't understood. I think you could overstate how much it wasn't understood because I think it was pretty obvious to a number of people almost immediately how this worked. And it works much the way I said. The kicking helps by giving you noise, giving you a fluctuation so that we can grab a hold of this fluctuation, favor its peak, and start to shed away all the rest of the radiation. So the kicking was just a source of noise. However, 
I have, a lab, I have uh, this kind of lasers in my lab. If you were to come to my lab, we do a variant on kicking. We're not so you know, crude as to kick the table. We have something that goes you know, click to the mirror or something like that. So it's an equivalent to a kick still. That's how the laser starts in my laboratory. OK, so um, now you know then about how a modern mode lock laser looks like. The tie sapphire itself, or the sapphire in the titanium sapphire, is um, not only the gain medium, it is also the nonlinearity, or the mode locking medium. That's not the only way to mode lock. You heard yesterday from Dr. Sutmeyer about using solid state mode lockers and uh, things like that. Uh, so there are other ways that based on more resonant processes, but this is the way to go to the shortest pulses. So now I want to go and talk about measurement of pulses. And so that's the next thing, and maybe I'll give a break after that, and then I'm going to start into high intensity and add a second. Before I do that, I want to stop and say for a moment that this short pulse that we've created is an extremely valuable thing. Can you imagine that we have created a pulse whose spectrum is phased over almost the whole visible spectrum? This is an incredible thing. It's amazing. When you think about quantum mechanics, when you think about going into a quantum system and creating or exciting with light, single photon or multi-photon, it makes no difference, single photon or multi-photon, the amplitude and phase of the, of the level that you create relative to the ground state level is transferred from light to the quantum system by photo excitation. In other words, you have a way to control amplitude and phase of a quantum system over a huge spectrum. And when you allow nonlinear optics to come in and play a role, you have a tool to go in and play, work with quantum mechanics, become a quantum mechanician, essentially. It gives us control over the quantum system. And I thought I couldn't pass this by without saying, here's how you become this nonlinear optics or quantum god, if you like. So here is a sketch of what you can do in order to get full control of this amplitude and phase of all radiation. So you bring a pulse in to a grating, spread it out as in a spectrograph. Out here, where you might put your plate to look at the spectrogram, instead of doing that, you put in one of these light modulators. We know that Miles is an expert on these light modulators, so if you decide to do it, call him up. He knows he's all the programs. Okay. At these special light modulators, they can be set up so you can control the amplitude and the phase of the frequency on whatever pixel you're looking at. So in other words, if you spread it out and you have 500 pixels, you have 500 different amplitudes and 500 different phases you can place on this pulse. That's how you become nonlinear optics god. Then you go back through an equivalent spectrograph, undo it, and out comes the pulse that has the amplitude and phase shape you wish that you can impress on the quantum system under, under, under interest. You can sculpt any pulse limited only by the pulses, uh, the spectral resolution of the setup. Okay, so now I want to go on to measuring short pulses. And it's important that you see it because we're going to have to measure at a second pulses and I want to bring you up to what can be done. So, First, nothing is as short as a short pulse. Nothing controllable is as short as a short pulse. I've said that once before. It's actually not true. You'll see it later on. In some ways, it's not quite true. Um, but to a large extent, it is. So you need to find a way for the pulse to measure itself. And so the first thing that you naturally think about is something like an autocorrelation. In fact, I showed you in those figures before were autocorrelations, and so about three slides, I will show you how that was taken. So think about the pulse coming in. We need autocorrelation, so we need to split it in two. So think of the pulse coming into a beam splitter, one part going through one arm, 
one part going through another arm of this beam splitter, um, of this uh, interferometer. The two pulses are then focused to a second harmonic crystal where second harmonic can be generated. And we will look at the bisecting angle for this arrangement, looking at the second harmonic that's created at the bisecting angle. Well, radiation from this beam comes into the second harmonic and into the second harmonic generating crystal, and in principle can make second harmonic going in that direction, but we don't see it. Similarly, radiation can come along this path into the second harmonic crystal, make second harmonic, but we don't see it if we have an aperture or something. However, it's possible for a photon from this beam and a photon from this beam, if they're simultaneously present, you can take one photon from each beam. Conservation of momentum gives you the second harmonic coming out in the middle direction. So I have a way of seeing that there's a photon simultaneously from this beam and this beam. And now all I have to do is move the beams back and forth, one with respect to the other, and I can see how they overlap. So it sounds, here is a sketch of what it would look like, or the, the overlap region, and you can see sort of how it, how it goes. Since it's one photon from one beam and one photon from the other beam to create the electric field, this is the equation for the, it's a nonlinear, this is proportional, I shouldn't have equal, I should have proportional, because I don't have other coefficients in there. And so I do have the proportional here, but I don't have a complete correct. Okay, um, so this is the equation. The signal, which we'll see, which will be intensity or number of photons, is the square of each of these, and so it's an intensity autocorrelation. So it's quite simple. It's intensity times intensity because it's field times field squared. Um, as an assignment, I thought, I'm not going to be here to check if you do it, you might like to look out, uh, look at this and show that the half width of the intensity autocorrelation for a Gaussian pulse is square root of two, the half width of the pulse Gaussian pulse itself. So the autocorrelation does not measure directly the pulse, it measures something broader than the pulse in this case. In fact, I have to tell you some prior information. You heard about that yesterday, about using prior information. I have to tell you some prior information for you to know how to read the autocorrelation trace. So in this case, I told you the pulse is Gaussian. If I told you the pulse had a different shape, there would be a different answer here. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. So this is a problem with autocorrelation, yet we know for most pulses coming out of short pulse lasers, roughly their shape, and so it works reasonably well in practice, and it's used in practice. If you came to my lab, you would see autocorrelators and if you probably come to many labs around uh, France and Switzerland, you would see autocorrelators in many places. The actual figure I showed you when I looked at the pulse, there it is right there, is made from a slightly different version of this. At first glance, it looked like it would solve some of these uncertainty problems, but it doesn't because the problems come from a much deeper cause. We bring the input pulse in, and now we build a Michelson interferometer so that when they come back and they come back together again, they're completely overlapped, going straight forward together. So now we have an interference possibility when they overlap. Imagine two pulses almost exactly overlap, and as we modify the phase of one from the other, we can have constructive or destructive interference, and that's actually what causes this modulation that you see here. It's the interference, as I move this back and forth, as seen through a second harmonic crystal. So the interfered beam is made second harmonic. And so you can seem, seemingly trace out the oscillations, which you do, you seemingly, you do trace out the oscillations. And so here is the uh, figure, and the um, equation is more complicated, I won't write it out, but you can imagine what it must be. I have the possibility now of second harmonic from each of the beams independently. So I'll have that. There will be a background signal. You can see that background signal here from each of them independently. One pulse here, one pulse there, making their own second harmonic. And I have the possibility coming from this 
um, from the overlap. The problem, the deep problem, is that there's a mathematical theorem, which I've never really read myself, but I know it exists. I don't know how hard it is to prove. But there is a mathematical theorem that says that 1D information cannot be uniquely, uh, cannot be uniquely inverted. There will always be uncertainty about the pulse. It just does not work for 1D information. 2D information, um, for example, spectrum and delay are different. They allow a unique reconstruction. So I'm going to come to that in a minute. This idea is very deeply connected to other things going on in science way beyond optics or way beyond the optics like we work on. You may have heard about the efforts that justified, I think, the synchrotron, not the synchrotron, the free electron lasers around the world, especially in California, to try to make single shot measurements of the three-dimensional structure of a molecule. This is called coherent diffractive imaging. And coherent diffractive imaging is somewhat the same kind of problem. You bring a beam in, you scatter it, and you get an intensity structure. And you want to know amplitude and phase so you can reconstruct the full beam. That's possible for a 2D measurement. It's not possible for a 1D measurement. And we fall so far into the 1D problem. Before I go further, however, I want to just say, I'm not going to tell you anything about doing experiments, but I want to say that um, a method for measuring a pulse is almost the same as a method for measuring something unknown. The difference is what you know. If you know the pulse, if it's been otherwise characterized, then you can use the pulse in an arrangement like this to look at the dynamics of an unknown sample. And that's called pump probe, pump probe spectroscopy, but it's no different to what I introduced you to for autocorrelation before. If you don't know the pulse, then you put in a known material. Second harmonic generation is so simple. You put in a known material, and you characterize the pulse. But the arrangement is the same. And so the thousands of people doing pump probe spectroscopy are effectively doing autocorrelation. They're doing the same kind of experiment. It's not essential in pump probe spectroscopy to look at the pulse because you're interested in the material. So it's possible you can put a detector out here and look at what happens to a probe pulse as a result of a pump pulse. But it's possible that you can look at photoelectrons created, fluorescence created, a whole set of other things. And so there are differences, but the basic idea remains very similar. And you will see that occur also within attoseconds. OK, I think we uh, have an hour and a half. It's a good time for a break. It's about halfway through. So why don't we take a 10-minute break? Is that what you do? 10 minutes? 10-minute break. Come back in 10 minutes. And I will then go into frog and then short pulse. Short pulse. OK, so uh, welcome back. Um, so I want to introduce you now to another method that solves this problem and removes the ambiguity on the pulse. And it's called Frequency Resolved Optical Gating, or FROG. Uh, before I start, you can see that this is kind of a whimsical name. It was named by Trebino, who I've taken some of these slides from, as you saw. Um, and he started a tradition in the field that all methods for measurement have got these cute names. Frog, Grenouille, uh, Rabbit, uh, uh, all kinds of things, Spider. And I won't try to explain all of them or any more than frog to you. But frog is uh, a, a very nice method of measurement that allows you to fully determine amplitude and phase of the pulse. <clears throat> so I ended up the last class by saying that there was a theorem of mathematics that says that if you have one-dimensional information, it cannot be uniquely um, inverted. There's no way. However, surprisingly, if you have two dimensions of information, if this is a two-dimensional system, that could be diffraction, where you have two-dimensional diffraction pattern, or other, um, then it's, you can uniquely invert amplitude data 
getting amplitude and phase. And so frog gets uh, both amplitude and phase from two-dimensional information. In this case, um, so let me get myself back in sync here. So in order to understand it, it's useful to stop and think about a, f a musical score. So acoustic information, in acoustic information or in music, we tell how time and frequency evolve. Right? There's, a, there's a musical score, and in this case, the frequency is just going up linearly in time. It's a linear chirp, just like I described a linear chirp in optics before. Frequency versus time information. A musical score lives in the frequency time domain. So a spectrogram, then, is something that you could get this spectrogram by putting a gate around and asking, what is the frequency at this time? What is the frequency at another time? And what is the frequency at a third time? So now you can see where the gating is going to come from. We're going to put a gate around the pulse and look and see the, um, and it's frequency resolved. So we're going to be looking at the score or the spectrogram optical gating. So it's going to be an optical gate. You know everything about why the term is what it is. Okay. Um, this is, for, again, from Rick Trevino, and it gives an illustration of how that would go. But I think maybe it's transparent when you have the idea that you just split the skate through and you look at the frequency versus time, like a musical score. So a spectrogram uniquely determines the wavefront intensity and the phase. The gate doesn't have to be short. In fact, it shouldn't be too short. It can, needs to be longer. And what you're trying to do is the spectrogram temporally resolves the slow part and it spectrally resolves the fat part, the frequency. So that's what you're trying to do as you move through. So I want to show you, I won't try to go through much more than this. I just want to introduce the idea, the idea of frog. And we will use this idea for measurement of out of second pulses. Okay. So frog, frog involves gating the pulse with the pulse itself. So again, we bring the beam, we split it in two, and then we bring the material, bring the beams in to a nonlinear medium, and it can be almost any nonlinearity you want. There are all kinds of ways to do this frog. But the nonlinear medium allows you to do this gating through the nonlinearity. Here it's shown as the Kerr effect, a Kerr rotation. And that's the easiest one to see. So you sort of gate a frequency through with the Kerr effect using a polar polarization and flipping the polarization when the other beam is on. And in this beam that is allowed through because of the other beam, so this Kerr effect, you place a spectrometer. So we do something extremely close to what I said. This gate, one pulse gates, goes through and looks at the frequency as a function of time delay. So the only thing we've done different than the autocorrelator is put in a different nonlinear material. In this case, it could be glass because it's a chi-3. It's an N2 effect, so even glass. It's even simpler. In practice, people generally use a second harmonic crystal, and it's a little more complicated. But it's really beautiful to see when it's the Kerr effect. And then we place, instead of a, a single detector, uh, a spectrograph. And every time delay, we have a spectrum. So ultrafast, uh, so all kinds of nonlinearities can be do, do. So that's the basic approach. I won't tell you about the algorithm to undo it. It's an iterative algorithm, but um, there's the theorem of mathematics that says you can always do it. So I'll leave it at that point, but you now understand that you can actually look at this spectrogram and measure the spectrogram. OK. so. Now I want to go on to high intensities and the next part of the talk. And I won't do too much this part. I probably will finish a little before 10, so we'll have time, 10 minutes or something like that, for questions and discussions, maybe 15. I don't know. Probably more like 10. Um, so I want to begin to introduce you to extreme nonlinear optics. In some ways, it began 50 years ago. Uh, 50 years ago, Keldish wrote a paper. This is L.V. Keldish, Russian scientist, quite a famous scientist. Wrote a paper. He published it in uh, Soviet literature in 1964. It was translated into English in 1965. 
And it was called uh, Ionization in the Field of a Strong Electromagnetic Wave. It's an amazing paper. Um, in it, he, first he treats solids and atoms together. So solids and atoms simultaneously together. And what he said was that if this parameter, which by now is called the Keldish parameter, if gamma squared is less than 1, multiphoton ionization could be approximated by tunneling. Okay? So let's talk about what's there, what's gamma squared. So gamma squared is the ratio between the ionization potential of the atom, multiphoton ionization, or the band gap if it's in the solid. You're taking an elect electron from the conduct valence to the conduction band, band gap in the solid. And ponder mode of energy is the oscillating energy of a classical electron in the field of a light wave. So electron at rest, turn on the light wave, it jiggles like this, work out the average energy. It's Q squared, E squared over 4M omega squared, just classical physics. And so that's the ponder mode of energy. So that ratio, if that's less than one, you can treat it as tunneling. It's amazing. Just to give you some numbers, uh, UP, ponder mode of energy, is 6 EV for 800 nanometer light and 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter. That's a good number for ionization of many atoms or molecules. Most molecules will be ionizing comfortably at that case, that case. Many atoms, but not helium. Helium would not even feel it, probably not nitrogen. <clears throat> um, the ponder mode of energy for is 2.3 EV for 3.5 micron light and 2 times 10 to the 12 watts per square centimeter. I'm going to end up my talks by talking about solids, so I want you to come back and just remember that. So we'll be in this condition in both cases. That paper, as I said, is an amazing paper. It's had, uh, well, I, this is about a year old, but I looked it up. It's had 2,800 citations in its English translation and 1,250 in its Russian original. So it's an amazing thing. I mean, if we could write papers like that all the time, well, it's amazing. Um, I just say it's a, just an astonishing idea. Um, here I've got sketched a Coulomb potential, an orbital inside it, and the potential and the potential, and the electron comes out. And in some ways, he's saying, I can make a beam splitter for an electron. Some portion stays behind, some portion comes out. A beautiful beam splitter, I guess maybe quantum mechanics often makes beam splitters, but this is a particularly beautiful beam splitter. It's also amazing because he says the static theory describes a process that occurs in the field that's oscillating in 2.7 femtoseconds at 800 nanometers. So the window for tunneling is only a few hundred attoseconds. So a static theory describes a reasonably well, I mean, it's approximation, of course, reasonably well, a 300 attosecond phenomenon. It's incredible. Uh, <clears throat> thus, I'd say in 1964, Keldish made the first steps towards attosecond science, and even in his paper, the next step too, although I don't know to what extent he it's hidden in the paper, and nobody understood it was there, and I don't think, I'm not sure it's hidden in the paper. So the next step, too. So what is the next step? He didn't do it classically, but I'm going to give you the, the idea classically. So here's a Coulomb potential in the presence of a field. I'll just take the field as if it's static, because it's tunneling. The electron is going to tunnel from inside to the outside. Let's assume that the electron emerges with zero velocity. Uh, that may be a bit overstated, because maybe quantum mechanics would never allow you. On the other hand, the electron is just becoming real. So, um, but even if not, I'm going to make an approximation. I'm going to assume it starts with zero velocity. And <clears throat> we'll assume that the electron emerges at a position outside. That's where it would emerge. Or maybe I'll even forget that part and let it emerge in the atom. The wavelength's long enough, it won't make much difference. Um, <clears throat> at a peak field of 3 volts per angstrom, the 10 to the 14 watts per square centimeter, the ionization potential of 13.6, the outside where the electron becomes real is approximately 4 angstroms. So that's, that's about the offset if you want to put it in. Um, so let's ask what happens to that electron after it's formed after it gets into the continuum. 
So it might be a reasonable approximation to say that once the electrons in the continuum, we can ignore the Coulomb potential of the ion. Pretty soon the electron's going to be away. I mean, at first, it's even four angstroms away already. So let's ignore it to keep everything simple. That's called the strong field approximation. It's used everywhere here. That once the electron's out, you ignore the ion, but of course it's an approximation. Not even a great one, but it's okay. So the rest is just F equals MA. You can do this in your head. You could do this uh, no time, and I won't go through each step. The force is just QE. So there's the equation. For the velocity of the electron, um, we can integrate it. So there's the velocity of the electron. The electron is oscillating back and forth, and it has a constant of integration, and that constant of integration is determined by the initial conditions in the problem. This is first year physics. Um, applying that the velocity at time t e equals the time of ionization, whatever that is, says that is the initial condition, and that determines the velocity of the electron from then on in this field, in this oscillating field. So the electron oscillates and it drifts. It drifts with this value, and depending on what t prime is, the drift velocity can be faster or slower. Okay? So it, vo it oscillates like an electron initially at rest with the oscillating energy that we talked about before, and the uh, drift velocity is given by that. It can go all the way up to QE over m omega if for some reason the electron could be born at the zero crossing of the field. Okay? So that's what happens. Tunneling determines the range of times that are available for this electron to be born. And you can do this. It's no more complicated than this. So, <clears throat> so uh, just now when you're doing it, so I thought I'd ask a few questions or homework assignments if you wish. So. Take, assume the atom ionizes in circularly polarized light when the field is pointing in the x direction. So circularly polarized light, field is pointing in, well, let's call this the x direction. So ignoring the ion field, just like we did before, find the kinetic energy and the direction of the electron. So the motion will be very different. In linearly polarized light, electron goes like this, and it might go like that, or it might go like this back past the atom. In circularly polarized light, you'll find that the electron goes like this. It's a simple, it's a very simple, same thing, classical physics. Uh, compare what happens to the energy of the electron or the average energy of the electron, the drift energy, um, it, um, for an electron born, say, at the crest of the field for linearly polarized light versus circularly polarized light. Well, circularly polarized light has no crest. Um, and confirm that angular momentum is conserved. We've talked about angular momentum. That's an interesting thing to do. It's quite easy to do. You'll see that classical physics gives you the conservation of angular momentum, but we heard of that from Miles a couple of days ago. It's actually an interesting thing to do. And if you want to put in the offset of the electron's moment of birth, it's even more, it's even more interesting. It's beautiful. I, I won't tell you more. It's fun to work out, and you'll see an awful lot of the conservation and things like that. And you'll see how classical physics and quantum mechanics give you the same result. <clears throat> OK, back to the linearly polarized light. What happens to the electron? Well, here's, let's say, the peak of the field, the crest of a field. If it's born before the crest of the field, the trajectory that the electron would follow is sketched there in blue. If it's born at the peak of the field, the trajectory is like this, coming back to its moment of birth and away, and back to the moment of birth and away, the position of birth, I should say, and away. And if it's born after the crest of the field, the electron comes back and passes the ion from which it left. That will be the recollision that drives at a second science. Okay? So, just to give you a sense for the distances, the distance, um, alpha sub zero, that's again classical physics. You can work it out, QE over m mega squared. The typical distance is sort of on the order of a few tens of angstroms that this electron is moving. But that depends on the intensity or the field, as you can imagine, and it depends on the wavelength of the light. If you do this with long wavelength light, the electron can go tens, hundreds, or thousands of angstroms. Okay? And this is ignoring the magnetic field. If you do it really high intensity, 
J cross B forces have to be brought in. And, but that's easy to do too. Okay. Um, now let me say a little bit about what happens to this electron in the other direction. So, so far, we've talked about the electron moving along the direction of the field and how it moves. In the direction perpendicular to the field, there is no force on the electron classically. So whatever happens when the electron is born is what's going to happen then for the future as long as there are no stray fields around in your chamber. So you can set up and look at the electron that comes out and you know what quantum mechanics gave this electron as it emerged from the, from the barrier. Again, you can work out what that should be on the back of an envelope in the following sense. If we take this as the tunneling equation, so this is what it would be for hydrogen or hydrogen-like atom. This is the tunneling rate. This is the atomic frequency, so that puts it in atomic units. Everything here is in atomic units. All the ratios are to put things in atomic units. This is the ionization potential of the ion in question versus the uh, atomic energy. Uh, this is the field of the f that's doing the tunneling or the laser field versus the atomic field. So that's the equation and you can find that in lots of textbooks. I won't, I won't derive it, of course. So that's the equation and if you assume that this electron that's trying to tunnel, well let me try to give you a, an image for that. Let me, so, let me say, so here's the potential. The electron is here. And let's assume we want this electron to get out. It would like to get up as far as it could here to get out through the barrier. Any, mo any momentum it has in the wrong direction will make it ricochet off the barrier before it gets there, in and out like that. And it will have a longer distance to go and a deeper tunnel through which to go. And so exponentially, that's a disadvantage to the electron. If we say that any momentum in the momentum wave function or in, is a wasted energy and is equivalent to increasing the ionization potential by p squared over 2m. This is a very rough calculation, but it gets the right answer. p squared over 2m. So we'll make the ionization, effective ionization potential higher by that wasted energy in the momentum wave function. And we just apply it inside this equation. We come up through just three steps. It's really trivial. You come up with that the Ionization rate depends on transverse momentum squared in this relationship, a Gaussian-like relationship. So that's the relation, or that's the energy coming out from the, from the, in the lateral direction. I personally like to think of this tunnel as a filter on the orbital. If you take the wave function, the momentum wave function, and you say, what does it look like as seen through a filter determined by this tunnel? and that Gaussian filter that's on this tunnel, then you see what, that's what you see. So let's look at that, look at that width and see what it is. So here's a measurement done with circularly polarized light ionizing argon. This is the energy, drift energy in the classical direction and this is the energy in the non-classical direction in either of these two non-classical directions. So we can simply measure this with an electron detector, see what they are, and see what happens in the non-classical direction. And here's actually a set of measurements that we get. This is done for argon at two different wavelengths. This is what you calculate with that very simple calculation right there for the field dependence of that width. And you might think this is a big difference, but the zero in this curve is down on the floor. So the difference is small, about a 10% difference. In fact, the calculation that I did is the same as you can get through a much more complicated result through, uh, through a much more complicated way over two or three pages of math. So it's not quite right, um, but, the, uh, but it turns out that our measurements now have been checked against the Schrodinger equation, and this is, this is a correct, our measurements are correct. So most theories that are around underestimate the width slightly. Um, so this is kind of neat. If you have some more complicated orbital than just a p orbital coming out through a, through a tunnel, 
which doesn't have much information in it. But if you take a molecule where you can line it up and force a structure of an orbital, where, for example, there's a node and pull the electron out with electric field and put it on a detector, then you see that nodal structure directly in the signal that comes out. Actually, here is a normalized difference to make it more distinct, but the nodal structure is there directly in the raw data. So that's the nodal structure of the wave function coming through the tunneling filter. Okay, so I would li I'm going to leave you right here. This is my last view graph. This, I think maybe I got one more, but I don't think so. So now we know about the electron. We know it's being pulled out. We know what its chances of being driven back are, because you did the F equals MA calculation. We know how it's spreading out laterally. So we could calculate, given this electron ionized, what are the chances that it comes back and hits me in the face? OK? Um, so here it is. This is that calculation. Given it is ionized, we know, some, we know a lot about it. We can calculate what are the chances. I place it in current density instead of probability. The probability is half that it's going to come back. So what's the current density maybe is a more interesting way to put it. What's the current density as a function of time, given at time t equals zero, the electron ionized? So here it is, a burst of radiation. I put the colors on top of it. The electron comes back, and the current density, the effective current density, is essentially 10 to the 11 amps per square centimeter at its peak. Now, this is a huge density. This is a huge current density. Current densities like that don't occur in the ordinary world. Maybe if I took a, a slack or some, some accelerator at CERN and focused the electron beam, I might get to such an intensity. But these are really extreme circumstances. So this is this kind of current density. So this is un, so maybe you won't be so surprised that it coming back and recombining is going to give us atosecond pulses. Okay. And maybe I should interpret before I leave the swings here. The electron comes out, it comes back, it hits you in the face. If it misses, it comes back and hits you from the back of the head. That's the next one. If it misses again, it hits you again from the front, the back as it slowly disperses away. And that's the slowly dispersing away, and those are the other peaks. But for almost all of the stuff that we're interested in, at a seconds, this is the only part we're interested in. In fact, only from the peak forward, mostly. The phase gets more complex eventually, and we don't have to worry about it too much. OK, I think it's time to stop. And I think this is where I plan to stop. Do I have anything else to know? No. So recollision will lead to extreme nonlinear optics and at a second pulses, and that's the next lecture. <laughs>